Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Clinton Presidential Center for the 38th installment of the Compurist Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I'm also joined tonight by my colleague, Dr. Jay Barth, the director of the Clinton Library, and uh, Dr. Vicki Soto, who serves as the Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service. And I think on my way, way in, I spied Skip Rutherford here, who is the former Dean of the Clinton uh, School of Public Service. So, so glad you all are here joining me tonight. Um, I'd like to start the program by recognizing the Compurist family who endowed this incredible lecture series with AT&T. Please accept our dearest, our, our real sincere appreciation for the gift you've given our community. Thank you all. And I wanna thank our Clinton Center ambassadors and donor whose support is essential to uh, our impactful work and to our fabulous volunteers who are here with us each and every day. We could not open the Clinton Center on any day without your incredible service. And we're very, very grateful to you as well. Let me also recognize my longtime friend and mentor, Mac McClarty. Uh, who is here uh, with us, and Donna McClarty. Mac called me up a few months ago and, and suggested I connect with Mr. Hussman about this terrific opportunity, and so we are, we've are we been looking forward to this program for months. So, Mac, thank you for that call, and thank you and Donna both for joining us. Tonight's special guests are former Washington Post executive editor and author Marty Barron and veteran newspaper publisher Walter Hussman, Jr., now, I make it a priority to read the Washington Post and the Arkansas Democrat Gazette every day, and I encourage you all to do the same as newspapers still remain cornerstones of our democracy. And speaking of newspapers, we're delighted to have with us the current publisher of Waco News, Inc., and the current president of the Arkansas Press Association, Eliza Gaines. Eliza, where are you? You're here somewhere, I think. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for all you do. Our program tonight will center on Marty's book, Collision of Power, Trump, Bezos, and the Washington Post, which is a fascinating insider's view of the Washington Post's evolution from a family-controlled business to a Jeff Bezos empire, empire or enterprise, I guess you could say. Marty Barron retired at the end of February 2021 after serving more than eight years as executive editor of the Washington Post and new staff under his leadership won 18 Pulitzer Prizes. And while he was the top editor of the Boston Globe, it won six Pulitzer Prizes. Walter E. Hessman Jr. is the chairman of Waco Media Inc., publisher of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and several other newspapers throughout Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee. He was named editor and publisher uh, editor and publisher's publisher of the year in 2008, and has received numerous other recognition throughout his distinguished career. He was a member of the board of directors of the Associated Press from 2000 until 2009. And in October 2019, the journalism school at the University of North Carolina was named the UNC Hussman School of Journalism and Media. Now, two quick housekeeping items, please uh, take this opportunity to silence your cell phones. And do wanted to let you know that following our program, Marty Barron will uh, be signing books, uh, which are available for purchase from the Clinton Museum Store. Now, it is my pleasure to turn over the program to Marty and Walter. Thank you. <laughs> Lost my microphone. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank Marty for coming to Little Rock and uh, and and talking with us today. Um, my opinion, Marty is probably the most respected journalist in America. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great honor and a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I also want to thank everybody here for coming out and uh, tonight. So I thought we were going to have a bunch of rain, but it, it, it wasn't quite as bad as we thought. So. Anyway, I think the format for tonight is uh, questions and answers, and so I've got some questions prepared for uh, Marty, and then actually the uh, Clinton uh, Library, the center, has given me some questions that you, the public, have submitted, and I'll, I'll ask him those too. So, okay, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Great, Great. to be here. Great. 
So, um, Marty, back in 2017, a noted journalist uh, stated on national uh, television uh, a statement, and I'm gonna gonna quote this journalist. It was quote. I don't believe in the false equivalency of giving both sides. Uh, Marty, from your experience as editor of some of the largest metropolitan papers in the country and as editor of the Boston Globe, uh, covering the Catholic Church handling of clergy sexual abuse, could you comment on news organizations' obligation to give both sides and whether, first, is giving both sides necessary and second, is giving both sides sufficient? Uh, great. Um, go to the tough ones right away. So <laughs> uh, I think we need to give both sides, uh, but I'm glad you asked the second question. It's not sufficient. Um, I think our obligation, what I like to talk about is really the idea of objectivity, and that is we need to listen to all sides. We need to talk to everyone we need to, the, who, who should be spoken to. We need to look at the entirety of the evidence, uh, and then we need to look at it rigorously, comprehensively, thoroughly, um, independently, um, all of that. Talk to everybody, listen to everybody, um, but we need to, ultimately, the objective is to try to get at the truth. Uh, so, yes, we do want to give hear what everybody has to say. We do want to publish uh, all sides, not just both sides. There are frequently more than two sides, by the way. Uh, the world is much more complicated than it's not a binary world where it's always this way or that way. There are a lot of nuances and, com and complexities involved. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I think we need to get beyond that. Uh, so, um, and I have an example that I would give is the work that we did in the Boston Globe on the, on the Catholic Church. Uh, that started because you had a, a lawyer for plaintiffs who were survivors of sexual abuse who said that the cardinal himself was aware of um, uh, abuse by one particular priest, serial abuse by one particular priest, and yet ignored it and reassigned this priest from parish to parish without telling anybody. And the church denied that, flatly denied that. And the Boston Globe had published both sides. Um, that was balance. But balance wasn't enough. What I asked at my first meeting on my first day at the, at the Boston Globe is, can't we get beyond one side saying one thing and the other side saying something else? Can we get at the idea of the truth? So yes, we have an obligation to listen to all sides. We have an obligation to um, air all sides, um, either in print or on digitally or on, on radio or television or wherever it might be. Uh, but uh, what we the ultimate goal is to try to get beyond that and to get at the actual facts and get at the truth and then let the evidence tell you how much weight each of those deserves. Yeah, so really what you're saying is the ultimate assignment is get to the truth. It is. I mean, and that's been the case at every place I've ever worked. Uh, you know, and at the Washington Post, when you walk into the newsroom, uh, they have this set of principles that were set down in 1935 when the Post was acquired by Eugene Meyer out of bankruptcy. Uh, papers still had bankruptcy even then. And he bought it out of bankruptcy and he had a set of principles. And the very first principle was to tell the truth as nearly as it may be ascertained. And what's the point of that? The point is that getting at the truth is a process. It takes time, requires us to learn, requires us to listen. Um, there's just a lot of work involved. But it also suggests that there is something there, it is a matter of the truth, that there is such a thing as truth, there is such a thing as reality and facts, and that not everything is just a matter of opinion. In fact, most things are not just a matter of opinion. And so our ultimate goal is to try to get at the truth, but that it takes a lot of work and it can take a lot of time. So in your experience, uh, did you find sometimes when you started pursuing a story, you had a pretty good hunch what you thought the truth was? And as you dug deeper and deeper, you found out, well, actually, it's something different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that every story, most stories, particularly the most sensitive stories, gets, they get started with a hypothesis. Otherwise, would you, why would you pursue that story? You think that it's a story there that's called news instinct. Uh, and we've had that ever since uh, news organizations have existed, ever since journalists, journalists have existed. So you start to pursue a story, but then you talk to all the people you need to talk to. You, talk, you look at all of the evidence that, that is available, uh, documentary evidence and other types of evidence, and it may not be what you thought. Uh, there may not even be a story there. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll tell ourselves, look, uh, the evidence just doesn't support what we thought was there, and so there's no story or the story is entirely different um, from what we thought. 
That, that's been my experience also. Um, so um, the New York Times publisher, Adolph Ox, back in 1896, quite a while ago, had a famous statement which was, quote, to give the news impartially without fear or favor. That requires courage not to fear the consequences of publishing news stories and editorials that might be unpopular. We have a classical case of that here in Arkansas back in 1957 when the Arkansas Gazette had the courage to publish articles on the integration of Central High School and also publish editorials advocating for the rule of law to follow a federal district court's order to admit black students to the school. Given that the Catholic Church is not, if not the most powerful institution in Boston, uh, it's certainly one of them. Talk about your experience as an editor there when you, you did the investigative series on sexual abuse by priests who continued to move from parish to parish. Yeah, um, well, it was. Uh, I, they're no longer the most powerful institution in Boston, and I think that's the result of the investigation that we did. It wasn't the purpose of that investigation, but it was the consequence of that investigation that the church lost power. But when I arrived in Boston in the summer of 2001, uh, no question, the, the Catholic Church was the most powerful institution in all of New England. Um, and I don't think any politician, any court, any any other institution was equivalent to, to the church in terms of overall power. And the result of that power was that accusations of um, abuse by clergy over decades had been suppressed. Um, the church didn't do anything about it except for reassigning priests from parish to parish without telling anybody, without telling the parish priest, without telling the parishioners, without telling, uh, without telling uh, the public. Um, and uh, when people complained to politicians, they didn't do anything. When they complained to law enforcement, they didn't do anything. Um, and so decades of, decades of abuse were uh, covered up as a matter of policy and as a matter of practice within, within the church. So, you know, our experience was that, um, you know, as I said, at the, my first meeting, I, we had these accusations, and I said, we have to get at this. And so um, we met with our outside lawyer, initially on that very first day uh, and asked him to take a look at the case and see what the opportunities were. Um, and then the columnist who had written the who had written the, the first column that drew my interest to this case, I said, by the way, we might go to court to try to get these internal church documents that would reveal the truth. And she said, well, that's great, but we've never done a proper investigation, a journalistic investigation. And I said, well, that, that can't be right. And she said, well, it is right. And uh, so we called together the investigative team, the spotlight team, and uh, they agreed to pursue this story. Um, and so we were on parallel tracks. We were on the track of uh, a journalistic investigation. And, and then ultimately, you know, in, in a few weeks, our lawyer came back to us and he gave us his assessment. And I said, well, what are, what are the odds? He gave us the assessment of a judge, of the law, of everything uh, involved there. Uh, fortunately, the judge was, um, was a woman. She wasn't part of the old boys club in Boston. That was good for us. Uh, there were matters in the law that could be in dispute, but we thought, you know, we had a chance. And I asked the lawyer, well, what are the odds that we might prevail? And he said, like any good lawyer, he said 50-50. So, <laughs> and I said, well, those are really good odds for a journalist. That's right, I'll take that. And so um, we pursued that. And ultimately we did get those court documents. And that was absolutely critical, is that we actually had documentary evidence documentary evidence that you people could see that when um, a, uh, a woman, typically it was a single mom who had kids, uh, had boys, and she wanted to have a male figure in the life of the kids, and she thought she could trust the parish priest, uh, and it turned out she couldn't. Um, and so when she became aware of abuse, she would complain, very devout, very devout Catholics, and complain to the archbishop and to uh, the bishops of, of uh, this abuse. And you, we had the actual letters that were sent by the cardinal and by others within the hierarchy of the archdiocese saying this priest will be taken out of ministry. And then the priest, we could demonstrate that the priest was not taken out of ministry. The priest was simply reassigned to another parish. And that would happen over and over and over again in multiple cases. So, um, I mean, it was a revelatory, and we certainly expected that when we published those stories that we would receive an enormous amount of blowback from uh, the community uh, because so many there were so many Catholics in, in the Boston area, and we got just the opposite. They felt uh, they were 
grateful for what we did. Uh, they were convinced and persuaded by what we did uh, because we actually could show the evidence and we could show it online and we could reproduce those letters uh, and all of the evidence online for the first time that we could ever do that. And so people felt betrayed, but they felt betrayed by the church. Uh, they felt that the church had betrayed uh, the parishioners and that it had betrayed the principles of the church. And in fact, that is, that is what happened. So it was an enormously gratifying experience in that sense. Um, and we kept at it. Uh, over the next year and a half, we published more than 900 stories uh, about that. And I think we needed to in order to keep up the pressure on the, on the church itself. Did we see a show of hands of the people here that saw the movie Spotlight about this? Well, most, most everyone, that's great. Thanks. Um, Marty, there's been some debate in the world of American journalism about objectivity and whether it should no longer be the standard in reporting of news. One of your employees at the Washington Post, Wes Lowry, uh, made this statement, objectivity obsessed both sides journalism is a failed experiment. We need to fundamentally reset the norm of our field. The old way must go. We need to rebuild our industry as one that operates from a place of moral clarity. So what are your thoughts on objectivity as a standard in news reporting? Yeah, well, I, I disagree with that statement by uh, my former colleague uh, at the Washington Post. He's a terrific journalist, but I disagree with him on that on that point, um, and strongly so, and I've written that. Uh, in fact, the way that we first met was when I wrote a piece about that uh, for, the, for the Washington Post uh, about in defense of objectivity. And I think it's important to remember what objectivity really means, uh, because it is not both sidesism. It is not false equivalence. It is not on the one hand, on the other hand, journalism. So this is a concept that goes back more than 100 years. It was popularized by Walter Lippmann, who was a, a noted, one of the most noted journalists in, in the United States. He had actually been a member of the Wilson administration um, and at the time that the U.S. Entered, in, entered into World War I, and he had actually been part of the propaganda arm. Uh, and uh, propaganda was coming into becoming a field of its own. Um, and uh, he came to regret his involvement in that, and he felt that the press was complicit in that propaganda. And he, felt, he came to feel that um, the press really needed a standard to overcome its own prejudices, its own preconceptions, its own pre-existing points of view uh, that all of us have, because if we're human beings, we all have opinions, right? Uh, it's only natural for a human being to have an opinion. But if we are to, if the objective is to get at the truth uh, and to get at reality and to get at the facts, the underlying facts, then we need to move beyond our own preconceptions. And so he proposed an objective method, as if we were very much modeled on the idea of uh, a scientist who begins an experiment with a hypothesis, uh, thinking that if he does an experiment that it, it might demonstrate something. And um, uh, so you start with a hypothesis, but then you let the evidence uh, dictate what the result is and the conclusions that you come to. And so the idea was to sort of set aside our own preconceptions, be, have an open mind, uh, talk to everybody, as we were discussing before, look at all of the evidence, look at it honestly and honorably, not selectively. Uh, I mean, obviously, if a scientist were to pick and choose among the evidence from an experiment, that would be considered scientific fraud. Um, so, uh, in a way, he was arguing that it would be journalistic fraud just to pick and choose among the evidence and not look at the totality of the evidence. And do that, and once we've done that, uh, we have a, an obligation to tell the public fearlessly, unflinchingly, what we've actually learned. Um, and but it, and to do, and to do that, and, and because the objective is to try to get at, is to get at the truth, uh, and and so, but he felt that the best way to get at the truth was to start with an open mind and a willingness to to look at everything, to listen to everyone, to be to be a learner, uh, not to assume that we have the answers at the beginning, but to ask the right questions and pursue the, pursue the answers. And I, the suggestion is that we have to. Uh, begin our work with a high degree of humility. Um, and, um, and so uh, recognizing that we're often seeing the world, uh, journalists are often seeing the world pretty much through a keyhole. There's no limit to what we actually know and can see. Sometimes we can swing the door a bit open and see a lot more. And then sometimes we can, with luck and skill, we can swing the door wide open, as I think we did in the case of the Catholic Church in Boston, and you can see the totality, the, the, to the total picture. Um, and so that is, um, um, but it has to start with an assumption, with, without assuming that we already know the answers, 
uh, but really working hard on thinking of what are the questions that really need to be answered, and then in a very rigorous and honest and honorable way, going and trying to find the answers. I remember reading something you wrote that uh, we all want object objective judges, we all want objective juries, we all want, want um, you know objective uh, science scientists, we want objective doctors. Why would we as journalists think that we should get a pass? And I, I think that's true, and I think that's what the public expects. We would want objective umpires too, by the way. I mean, if, <clears throat> if I mean, if we had an umpire, you know, uh, in the Red Sox Yankees uh, game, just to pull out an example out of the hat, uh, and and you know, you saw that the umpire wasn't actually expressing an opinion, but was constantly, let's say, tweeting like good news about the Red Sox and just tweeted without any comment, only about the Red Sox. And then there's a Red Sox Yankees game. Would you have any doubts as to where that, that person's uh, leanings were? And would you have any trust in the, in, the, in the decisions that are made by that umpire? You wouldn't. And so I think there are lessons for us as journalists um, in looking at what we expect of other people, of other professionals. And I, I, as I've said in my book, you know, we have no hesitation in holding other people accountable uh, for uh, a, a lack of objectivity. And by the way, we like to use the phrase objective reality. Uh, what does that actually mean? Uh, so we have no hesitation in holding other people accountable for that. Uh, we should hold our, we should expect that, well, I think the public already does hold us accountable and I think we should hold ourselves accountable as well. Uh, I was recently reading uh, the Columbia Journalism Review and a statement there caught my attention. And here it is in quotes. Only, it was talking about reporters, uh, only quote people who deserve to be quoted. Uh, how do you interpret that statement and what type of situations exist where somebody doesn't deserve to be quoted? Well, there's some actually. I mean, I, uh, I don't know what the context was for that, so I, I can't really weigh in on that specific uh, instance. Uh, but a person who doesn't deserve to be quoted is somebody who doesn't know anything about the subject that you're quoting them on, okay? Yeah. So uh, a person who doesn't deserve to be quoted would be somebody who has no direct, <clears throat> direct knowledge of a situation. So when we're, for example, in the instances where we have to use anonymous sources, and there are any number of those, uh, we can talk about that if you want, but um, the source ought to be somebody who actually has direct knowledge of what they're talking about, not second and third hand knowledge. Because as we learned in grade school, once you like sit in a circle and you tell one person and the other person tells the next person and the next person tells the next person, by the time it comes full circle, it's a totally different story. And so you have to be absolutely careful uh, with that. So it should be somebody who actually has direct knowledge and uh, certainly not somebody who is not an expert in the field. So, for example, in issues of public health, I think you, you know, you ought to be quoting people who actually know something about medicine and know something about public health. Um, so you were editor for, um, uh, I guess, all four years of the Trump's presidency. Mm -hmm. And um, one of your statements that got considerable attention, or as the current lingo goes, went viral, uh, <laughs> was, <laughs> quote, we are, and this is your quote, we are not at war, we are at work. Could you explain some context on that and what caused you to make that statement to your staff? Yeah, that'll probably be on my tombstone. It's the uh, most famous thing I said, maybe the only famous thing I said. <laughs> so um, so uh, Trump, on his first full day in office, the first thing he did is he went to the CIA. Uh, he obviously had a problematic relationship with the intelligence agencies. Uh, they had been involved in investigating uh, Russia's intervention in the, in, in the election of 2016. Um, so he went to the CIA. He was standing in front of a, memor a memorial to fallen CIA agents. And in front of that memorial, which is considered to be a sacred spot for CIA agents, uh, what did he choose to talk about? It's not a surprise. He talked about the press, uh, his favorite subject. And he said to these intelligence agents, uh, as you know, I have a running war with the media, uh, seeming to actually want to enlist intelligence agents in his war with the media since he was their ultimate boss. Um, and a few weeks later, I was asked uh, for my reaction to that. Uh, I was asked by uh, Kara Swisher, tech columnist, and Walter Mossberg, who were at the time working together. And, um, and they asked me for my reaction. And I said, we're not at, we're not at war with the administration. We're at work. Um, and it did go viral. 
Um, and as I, I was totally shocked by that. It went completely viral. It, somebody even put it on a t-shirt, which was available for sale. Um, uh, at a very low price, I'm sure, but very for sale. Um, and I, um, so what did I mean by that? I meant, um, what is our work as journalists in this country? Let's go back and look at the First Amendment. Um, and what James Madison had to say about the First Amendment, uh, since he was the principal author of it. And he talked about um, journalists um, freely examining public characters and measures. So, you know, public characters, politicians, government officials, people who have authority, who influence uh, the public, the public uh, sphere, uh, measures being the policies that affect the lives of everybody. Uh, free. I hope we understand that. Um, and then the word that really deserves uh, attention is examining. And that means that journalism is not stenography. Examining. Holding uh, people to account. People with power to account. Uh, looking beneath the surface and behind the curtain. Uh, who did what and why? Uh, who influenced those decisions and with what intent? Who's affected, by this, who's affected by those decisions and how? Those are the kinds of things that journalism is um, is supposed to do, uh, and that is our work. And when you talk about the President of the United States, the President of the United States is inarguably uh, the most powerful person in the world. And so our job as journalists, particularly at a place like the Washington Post, situated in the nation's capital, um, our job is to examine uh, the President of the United States. What is he doing and why? Who influenced those decisions and uh, with what intent? Uh, and who's affected by the decisions and how. Those are the kinds of things that we do, uh, and that is our work. Uh, and so I view that as the original assignment that the founders of this country gave to the press in this country, uh, and that we have an almost sacred duty to deliver for the public, uh, deliver on that assignment for the public. Yes, yeah, I, I, I think uh, if people on your staff were going around saying we're at war with the administration, it would really undermine the credibility of the newspaper. Well, there are people in there are people in the press who said we are at war. I mean, I, I got it went viral and it was was embraced right at the beginning, but a few months passed and every and certain other people started to say, well, that's really naive. That's wrong. Uh, if he's at war with us, and he's at war with a lot of our core beliefs about. Uh, free expression, about a free press, about um, tolerance for all people, uh, regardless of their race, ethnicity, religion, identity, all of that. If he's um, at war with a lot of our, uh, a lot of our core values, uh, then we have to recognize that it's a war, and we're in that war. Uh, and to not recognize that is naive. And that, is, that was their argument against me. Uh, and there were plenty of people in our profession who agreed with that, uh, thankfully, there are also plenty of people who agree with me. Yes, very good. Um, I'm talking about social media for a minute. And in, uh, in your book, you talk about problems you had uh, with some reporters uh, using social media. I believe you said the majority of your staff, uh, there wasn't a problem. They, they followed the Washington Post uh, ethical policies, but some did not. Um, so, you know, for years, newspapers have required their news reporters and people on their staff uh, not to make political contributions, not to post yard signs, uh, not to adhere bump st bumper stickers, and to avoid uh, any public positions on partisan or controversial public policy issues. But some, some reporters, not just at the Post, uh, do not want to follow that on uh, do not want to follow that policy on social media, claiming things like transparency and authenticity. So would you comment on your experience with that at the Post? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't know anybody who put uh, yard signs or made a political contribution or did any of that, uh, but I know uh, a number who actually were quite uh, vocal on social media in a way that I found highly problematic uh, for us as an institution. Uh, I thought it was uh, highly corrosive uh, to our uh, credibility uh, that uh, we, there were stories which we would take great care on, uh, took care with the way we wrote the stories, with the headlines that we used, with the photographs we used, with the captions that we wrote, you name it, with everything. Uh, and then one person on staff who was not involved in that story uh, would, would tweet something out uh, expressing a, what is essentially a political opinion, uh, and that would draw all the attention. Uh, and the story, they would overwhelm uh, whatever we did 
uh, in terms of the actual, as, a, as an actual institution. And I find that to be really problematic, and that's why we have these, gui that's why we have these guidelines, um, is, is, um, is to protect against that. Um, and, um, and so I was quite clear that I thought that that was inappropriate, uh, that that explicitly violated our, our actual guidelines, uh, that people shouldn't be engaging in that kind of activity. But people did say, well, look, uh, you know, we're not, let's not pretend that we don't have opinions here. Let's just uh, essentially let it all hang out. We can't be, and by the way, we can't be one person at home and another person at work, to which my response was, well, why not? Um, because we ask that of a lot of people, you know, we ask that of our police officers, we ask that of our judges, we ask that of our doctors. They're entitled to their opinions and whatever they say in their homes and whatever with their, with their family members or whatever it might be. But when they go to work, they're supposed to behave in a professional way and we expect them to. Uh, and so, um, um, so that was the problem that I had is that it, it really systematically undermined our, our reputation. And, um, you know, there were other media who were not friends of the Washington Post who were seizing on that and representing that as the Washington Post. And it really wasn't the Washington Post. It was like one person at the Washington Post who would do that, uh, or maybe a few more. Uh, and it wasn't representative of who we were or the standards that we, uh, uh, th that we tried to maintain at the, in the organization. Thank you. Um, as you know, the uh, Gallup poll has been uh, taking an annual survey of uh, U uh, confidence and trust in U.S. institutions now for over 40 years. Uh, and one of those, they do the Supreme Court, the presidency, the military, the police, et cetera. And they also do the news media. So trust in news reporting has been declining since 1979 when over half of the American public trusted it. Now it's at an all-time low, and Gallup most recently noted that only 16% of the public had confidence in newspapers and only 9% in television. What are some of the reasons you think for such a loss of trust in news reporting? Well, I think it's a really complicated subject. Um, I mean, keep in mind at the time of, you talked about the 70s, well, that was right post-Watergate, actually. So... Um, at the time that the Washington Post and other media were doing their Watergate investigation, the uh, the media and particularly the Post was accused of being a partisan, being engaged in a partisan effort, uh, an effort to undermine the Nixon the Nixon presidency. Um, and you may recall that Nixon's um, first vice president, Spiro Agnew, was constantly attacking uh, constantly attacking the media, uh, and until he himself got involved in the corruption scandal. But um, uh, but afterwards, you know, all that reporting was validated. Um, and, uh, and so confidence in the press really rose after that. And as you say, it's been on a decline ever since. I think trust is a real complicated uh, subject because trust tends to cut along partisan lines. So people who watch Fox News uh, are typically lean heavily to the right uh, politically, uh, and they trust Fox News pretty much everything on Fox News, uh, and they trust it implicitly. They don't trust CNN, they don't trust the Washington Post, they don't trust the New York Times, they don't, definitely don't trust MSNBC. So, um, um, and people who trust the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN, basically, uh, well, they don't trust uh, Fox News at all. Um, and so it's, we're a highly polarized society today. Uh, and that I think, and part of that is because we live in an internet era. First of all, before the internet, there were all these cable channels. I mean, when I grew up, uh, we only had three networks in this country. Uh, we had only a couple uh, of national news magazines, really. Uh, you had your local paper or two, uh, and that was pretty much the media environment at the time. And um, that's not the case now. Now you can go anywhere and find anything that affirms your pre-existing point of view, and they will tell you you're exactly right, no matter how um, off the wall your your theories might be. You will find somebody. I mean, I remember when uh, when Justice Scalia died. Uh, I was I think I was with the family member at the time, and I said, I bet if I go online now, I will find a conspiracy theory about Justice Scalia's death. Sure enough, I went online, and there was a conspiracy. There were several conspiracy theories about Justice Scalia's death, none of which, of course, have been validated. And so. We, I think polarization has a lot to do with it. I think our own behavior has a lot to do with it. And the fact that um, also is that I think we do need to re rededicate ourselves to, um, to doing our work in an objective way, listening to all people, never treating anybody with, uh, condescendingly or with contempt, um, 
And, um, and so we have a lot of work to, to do to regain that trust. I don't, I'm not sure it'll ever get back up to the level that it was in that post-Watergate era, but I think we can do a lot better than we're doing today. Yeah, as a parenthetical note, uh, that same, the same Gallup survey show there's considerably higher trust in local media than national media, whether it's actually the highest trust is in local television and then newspapers and radio and uh, so i think that reflects some of the national polarization isn't it? yeah i mean i think that's true i i should have mentioned that and, and threw out a you know compliment your way um uh but i do think look i mean i think that they're first of all they know you they you're a member of the community they see the reporters on the street they, they've interacted with them they see them in the grocery store they see them at the schools that sort of thing at the national level that's not true people aren't seeing us except maybe on television and um and in, in the case of uh news pe people who work for legacy news organizations newspapers uh well they may not see them at all it's just a name on a it's just a name on a story and we're dealing with the most highly charged issues, uh, far more highly charged. I mean, certainly there are highly controversial issues at the local level, but none of them actually rises to the level. The passions never don't don't reach the level that you see at, at the national level. So when you're dealing with those kinds of issues, uh, people are going to have a lower levels of trust. I skip, I skip my uh, next couple of questions and go to the questions that came from the public here. Um, we've got about another six and a half minutes to go. Um, Tell me what you think is a greater greater threat to democracy in America, uh, Donald Trump, or the loss of newspapers and news organizations in many small and increasingly larger communities. Boy, that's a <laughs> that's such a false choice. Uh, <laughs> can I say both? Um, I. I um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think you can rank those. Those are both are huge. I think the, the crisis in America, the greatest crisis in American journalism is at the local level. And I think democracy begins at the local level. And I think if we really want to know what's, if we want to people, somebody to write about the kinds of things that bind our communities together, news organizations do that, particularly news, newspapers. Uh, if you want somebody to be holding your local officials, whether on a city council, a county commission, or uh, the police department, or environmental agency, or whatever it might be, the school board, uh, well, somebody needs to do that, and that's typically the local newspaper. Um, so that is a threat, clear, clear threat to democracy. Uh, the stuff that uh, Trump is talking about quite openly, those are measures that you see in authoritarian countries. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in Latin America, and there are plenty of uh, dictators and wannabe dictators in Latin America. And a lot of the kinds of things that Trump is now talking about doing fall into that, that authoritarian category. Uh, so another from the public here is, uh, it says for several years after Jeff Bezos took over the Washington Post, and actually when you were editor, uh, his financial power was evident, reporting, graphics, innovations, all skyrocketed. But lately it has gotten much lighter with much more soft content, filler, and repeat articles. What is the reason for this? Um, well, I don't know that I... I Totally agree with that, but I—I I mean, I think you see some of that in the in the New York Times too. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you people are getting their emails about what's on wire cutter and what you should buy today. I just got one on plants I should buy online, uh, so uh, which I'm not going to do. And um, and uh, you know, their cooking recipes and all of that. The reality is that what's happened is that post Trump, um, uh, there has been less interest in the news. Uh, I mean, Biden has, hasn't been nearly as interesting, maybe for good reason, but less interesting. Um, and so, and people I think are, uh, are taking the press for granted once again. Um, and so there's been a real drop off in terms of readership. And one thing that the New York Times has done is that they expanded their portfolio and they've started doing this some years ago. So they invested a huge amount of money in their cooking app and now they have a huge amount of cooking content. They invested heavily, they acquired a uh, wire cutter, and so they have wire cutter content online too. They invested heavily in a games initiative, uh, starting with, of course, they started with their famous crossword puzzle, but they expanded to all sorts of other things most recently, well, one of the most recent being Wordle. So um, all that content is on the New York Times, and so I think if you look at the New York Times, you'll see a lot more of that so-called lighter content, but it's really lifestyle content. Uh, and I think the effort is to try to 
at the New York Times was really to try to insinuate themselves into people's daily routines and not just be a news site, but be more than a news site. Uh, and I think the Post is uh, trying to catch up. Okay, I want to make sure I get this question in from the public here. Um, what do you see as the future of print media and how will it foster confidence in print in the area in the era of artificial intelligence? Yeah, well, I um, I don't see much of a future in print media, to tell you the truth. Um, so um, actually, I just got a, a, a direct message on Twitter today from um, or yesterday from Jack Schaefer, who's the political writer, a uh, media writer at Politico. And he said he reminded me of a quote that said, I don't expect to see a lot of that. I, I, I'll be surprised if there are a lot of newspapers by the year 2025. And he said, this is why I don't make predictions. What's your prediction now? Um, and I said, 2035. So um, uh, the reality is that the newspapers are declining. Even, you know, uh, circulation for the New York Times on a day-to-day -day basis, daily basis, setting aside Sunday, has dropped off dramatically. Um, we live in a digital era. Uh, people get their information digitally. So that is, I think that's the future. Uh, we, can't, we can't pretend it isn't. Uh, artificial intelligence is a huge pro is a huge problem. Generative AI is a huge problem. Um, we will see and already have seen a lot of fabricated videos and still images and and audio. Uh, I think that will get worse. And then um, and then then there will be verified images, vi video and audio and and all of that. And uh, people will say that's not true. That was. That was fabricated uh, with generative artificial intelligence. And so the public won't be able to distinguish what's true and what's false. And that is a really, really dangerous place to be, not just for the press, but for society and democracy. Um, <clears throat> how will a shift from traditional print to electronic access change, uh, number one, the public's idea of memory regarding significant events? And number two, the public's view of newspapers traditionally thought of as newspapers of record. Uh, well, I mean, I think that this is going to be a problem. I mean, there are there is something called the Internet Archive that does actually store a lot of all these things. And I think so you do have a capacity to go back in time to actually look for things. But those are perishable. Um, I mean, there have been media outlets that simply went out of business and their their entire archive has disappeared. Uh, even the reporters who work there can't get access to, to show people the work that they actually did. So uh, that's been that's been a problem. Uh, the sec I, what was the second question there? Was yeah, well, um, that, the role of newspapers is played as a newspaper record where people can go back years later. Yeah, um, uh, I'm not sure that's going to exist for very long. If it does, even if it does today. Yeah. Okay. This is the last question. We're just about out of time. Um, says, Mr. Barron, what is your proudest accomplishment as a reporter and as an editor? Um, well, I don't have any great things to talk about it. When I was a reporter, I wasn't a reporter all that long. So I think the best thing I did as a reporter was become an editor. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, as an editor, I'm most proud of the work we did on the Catholic Church in Boston, uh, and the reason is because um, it affected ordinary people. Uh, you can cover the politicians all you want, and that gets them a huge amount of attention, uh, but what really matters is did you make a difference in the lives of ordinary people, and there were ordinary people who were trying to get the attention of the press, attention of law enforcement, attention of politicians, and they didn't get anybody's attention. And for years they suffered as a result of that, that nobody was paying attention to them and all that they had they had suffered through. Uh, and no one was holding, uh, in that instance, the church accountable. And so I, um, we finally listened. Uh, and they had, as is often the case, people without power often have very powerful things to say. And they did. Uh, and we finally held uh, the church accountable for uh, a decades-long cover-up. And it wasn't just... And, and, and the, imp the, the impact of that investigation has just been huge and ongoing, by the way. So it wasn't just in uh, the Archdiocese of Boston. Uh, it became all the United States. Then it was overseas. It's been in you know, Germany and Italy and in Spain now, and of course in Ireland and, and many other places, Latin America, throughout Latin America. Um, and, and it's affected not just the church, but it's affected all sorts of other institutions. So, and you see that play out in, in, um, at universities. It happened with Penn State, 
uh, with Jerry Sandusky. It had, the institutions felt they needed to respond in a way that they hadn't they hadn't before. It's happened with the Boy Scouts, uh, which had a, has had a huge uh, sexual abuse scandal. It's happened with lots of in, other institutions where now institutions no longer feel they can somehow just cover these up and protect the reputation of the institution. They actually have to confront the abuse and um, and treat these these uh, abuses for what they really are, which is a crime. Uh, and uh, it's not just a scandal, it is a crime. And, and so I feel incredibly proud uh, uh, of my involvement in that uh, because it affected ordinary people and nothing matters more than that. Well, I know it affected Boston, and, and, but I'll tell you, it was, it's, it was so great because uh, in Watergate and then when the movie, uh, All the President's Men came out, it was a huge resurgence of interest about young people wanting to become journalists. And I think what you did in Boston and uncovering things there, and then when the movie Spotlight came out, has a sort of the same effect. And, and we need more young people to be out there reporting the news. Right. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Walter. Well, thank you, Marty, for being thank here. Thank you all. Tonight. And uh, Marty, thank you for your willingness to come to the Clinton Presidential Center to share your thoughts on the place of journalism uh, in American life and society during this challenging period uh, for newspapers as a business and the additional complexities created by, the inter by its intersection with political polarization. So thank you very much. And Walter Hussman, thank you so much for your thoughtful moderation of this conversation and to your commitment to the importance of a daily newspaper in the life of our community and our state. So thank you all both. Remember, as Stephanie said earlier, uh, Marty will be signing copies of Collision of Power uh, just outside the doors uh, after we close out this event. So I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book this evening. Um, please also do allow Marty to go ahead and get out to the table, but feel free to stop by for a visit uh, with your book, of course, uh, while, you're, while you're there. Um, again, I want to thank our friends at AT&T and the Computers family for allowing the Clinton Presidential Center to bring important conversations such as this to our community. And on behalf of everyone at the Clinton Presidential Library, the Clinton Foundation, and the Clinton School of Public Service, I want to thank you all for being a part of tonight's event with your presence, uh, either here at the Clinton Center or online. Safe travels this evening, and we look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Thank you all.